Sharon Tate was a rising star and nearly nine months pregnant when she was viciously murdered along with four friends in August of 1969 by members of the so-called Manson family. Today, the house on Cielo Drive where Tate was killed no longer stands, but Hollywood's fascination with the actress and her murder remains. Charles Manson and four of his followers were convicted of the killings in 1971, and while two of them, including Manson, died behind bars, the rest remain in prison. It really caused a paradigm shift. I mean, at that point, it was August of 69 when the murders happened. It was December of 69, the last month of the 60s, that this group of what otherwise appeared to be peaceful-looking hippies, you know, young women with no makeup, long hair, peasant dresses, babies, and men with beards, long hair, blue jeans, uh, were all of a sudden put on the covers of, of every magazine and newspaper, not only in the country, but in the world, and identified as the vicious, you know, murderers of this beautiful 26-year-old mm. actress who was eight months pregnant. And that really shifted how people viewed hippies. Prior to then, you know, it was mostly they were, you know, harmless, using drugs. A lot of parents were worried about their kids becoming, you know, losing their own ambition. But all of a sudden, they kind of mutated into these monsters that they saw on television every night as, as you know, media covered this for the next year and a half during the trial. And they really lived up to to that monster image. And it made people for the first time really frightened of kind of the revolution that was happening in America at that time. It put an end to it, more or less. I, then I have to ask you this final question. Uh, was that orchestrated? Was Manson used by some nefarious force in America to uh, that end? Unfortunately, the reason the book took me 20 years to write was I wanted to say definitively it was. I can't, and I'm being honest here, but I do think I present a good case that it's more likely that it was orchestrated than that it wasn't. And a lot of that you'll see in what I did, am able to prove about how Bugliosi covered up so much information, suborn perjury at trial. I mean, these verdicts should have been thrown out. In fact, Bugliosi's co-prosecutor, Stephen Kay, when he saw the information I had, and he knew the case as well as Bugliosi, he said to me, he goes, I don't know what to think about this anymore. Wow. And he encouraged me to take it to the head district attorney of Los Angeles at the time. I said, what will he do with this? And he said he might have to throw out the verdicts and, and, and order new trials. You're never going to think of Los Angeles as the major crime city the way they did with, uh, with the Manson murder. Life magazine published the, the photograph of Charles Manson on the cover, and he looked wild and crazy. And I think people in the United States seem to like horror pictures. They go to the movies and they, they see the, the Halloween movies and everything. Well, here the people had a real live monster who could convince the young people to commit murder for him. After the Manson file came out, and that was really the first book that ever even presented Charles Manson, not only in a sympathetic way, but merely presented him as a human being. So it created quite a stir, and I said on national TV that the that Vincent Bugliosi had conducted a show trial, that, that what he presented as the narrative of the crimes, this whole helter-skelter, race war, Beatles theory, was not true. I welcome this kind of examination. You are free to do as we tell you. You are free to do as we tell you. His hip can be seen to move violently forward. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. That's why I don't read the newspaper. I'm a man. I'm 40. What did the president know, and when did he know it? I began by telling the president that there was a cancer growing on the presidency. As of now, I am in control here in the White House. This is crack cocaine from the White House. It could easily have been heroin or PCP. It's as innocent looking as candy. Good evening. This is Mae Bressel in Carmel, California. Anybody who's not willing to change based on what they learn is ignorant. Coffee's for closers only. We, I think we're, we're giving you enough. Go on to Chicago and let's win there. Keep hope alive! Keep hope alive! Keep hope alive! This is the Midnight Rider News Show with S.T. Patrick. 
Hi, this is Brad Schreiber. You're listening to the Midnight Rider News Show with F.T. Patrick. Hello, America and the world. Welcome to the Midnight Rider News Show. I'm S.T. Patrick, your friendly neighborhood host, traipsing and traversing through the trials and travails that have so tempestuously and untruthfully been blasted into your eyes, ears, and minds by the state sponsor Talking Heads, the court historians, and the textbook conglomerates that control information today. Tonight, we have episode 133, Nicholas Schreck on Charles Manson and the Tate LaBianca murders 50 years later. Our guest tonight is Nicholas Schreck, the author of The Manson File, and he'll join us next in the midnight hour. Now, we only have a mild cleaning of the castle tonight, and it concerns our magazine, Garrison. Now, I call it a magazine. It should really be called a journal. It's Our last issue was 252 pages. It's I think it's hardly a magazine at that point, but there may be a lot of you out there that are coming here tonight for the first time. I know Nicholas has a uh, large following in the Manson research community himself. So for everyone out there, I would like to tell you about Garrison, the Journal of History and Deep Politics. Now, what we do in this work is we simply challenge. We really challenge the historical establishment. We challenge the mainstream media. We challenge those mythological narratives so prevalent in schools today. And we touch on many issues you know, current and past. And they're issues that you would expect us to touch on if you've heard this show before. Issues like the Kennedy assassinations and Watergate and 9-11 and Jonestown, the Julian Assange stories, and so much more. So if you'd like to check out Garrison, the Journal of History and Deep Politics, and if you'd like to find out where it can be purchased, you can go to midnightwriternews.com. That's Midnight Writer, and writer is spelled with a T as in someone who writes. Midnight Writer News. Dot com. You can get all the relevant information there. You can also follow us on Twitter at Garrison Journal and at MWN underscore ST Patrick. Both of those are also on the website if you need them again. So we'll be right back with my friend Nicholas Shrek. This is Joseph E. Green of JoeGreenJFK.com and the author of the zine Intro to the Jonestown Massacre Conspiracy. November 2018 will mark the 40th anniversary of the massacre at Jonestown, but many questions still left unanswered. For more on Jim Jones, Jonestown, and the research of John Judge and Mae Russell, listen to episode 80 of the Midnight Rider News Show. Our guest this evening is someone I speak to annually on this show, usually in October, which of course means that we don't talk as much as we should, and I know that, but it's someone whose work that I do admire greatly, especially on this topic. Now, Nicholas Schreck is the author of The Manson File, the newest edition of which I will absolutely be badgering him about this evening, and he's also the director of Charles Manson's Superstar. Now, this year does mark the 50th anniversary of the Tate LaBianca murders, and there's been just a deluge of material coming forth from that. I'm sure Nicholas has quite a few opinions on that as well. So, joining us from Germany tonight, this is Nicholas Schreck. Nicholas, how's Germany this evening? Germany is cold, but uh, but it's my home, so so I'm happy to be here. Well, being in Illinois this time of year, I understand what that's like. We've been uh, dipping down recently into the 20s overnight, so it's a lot easier to sleep. Uh, but, you know, the holiday spirit's coming around, so it's it's getting a little frigid here as well. So I, I absolutely, absolutely do understand that. Well, it's, it, it's still atmospheric and Halloween-like here out in the forest in Berlin, so it's appropriate to speak of... Uh, of the matters we will speak of tonight. Correct. And what we'll speak of tonight are the Tate LaBianca murders and the Charles Manson story 50 years later. Now, it was August 8th and 9th of 1969, and it is so hard to believe that it's been 50 years, a half a century. But it's a story, Nicholas, that I still think is really at the forefront of our historical consciousness as a country. This was the 50th anniversary, but you still see multiple books released every year. You still see a plethora of documentaries, some with some sort of value and some that are truly dreadful. And you also see commemorations because it was the 50th anniversary, and you took part in a few of those as well. You did a very well-attended talk in Los Angeles. I believe it was sold out. But you also spoke to the LA Times while you were in the States, and you have a few other presentations planned for the remainder of this month. But what was it like being a part of this anniversary of the anniversary of such a story? Right. Well, I would I'd say to put it in larger context, the 50th anniversary of the Tate LaBianca 
and Shay, who gets forgotten, and Hinman murders um, the, in, from 1969 and 50 years ago. There has been a major sea change in the perception of the case that I don't think people who are who are maybe not as au fait with the way the media has treated it would really notice. But one of the interesting things, I was invited by the art gallery Lethal Amounts in Los Angeles to, first of all, there were two events to celebrate, if you want to say celebrate, maybe memorialize is, is the better word, um, the 50th anniversary. And one was a unique and uh, probably never to be repeated again exhibit in the Lethal Amounts Art Gallery of many of Manson's personal property, his letters from from his friends and collectors of Manson memorabilia that I helped to gather and brought them together. People like Ben Gorecki, Derek Hayes, Dennis La Calandra, and many others, people that had known Manson for years or or who had collected rare Manson material. So first of all, there was this quite extensive and very well done museum quality exhibit about Manson. And the interesting thing was, it was not controversial in Los Angeles on the anniversary of these murders. It did not, it, it was very well attended, but it didn't create the kind of uh, friction and controversy or stir up the hornet's nest of, you know, the usual hysteria that Manson did. So it's very clear that, that now that the Wicked Witch is dead, it's finally just being looked at as a historical event rather than a, a current danger. So that was very interesting, the way that was received. And so secondly, as part of this week-long memorial of the 50th anniversary, on the on August 10th, the 50th anniversary of the La Bianca murders, actually just by coincidence, right near the house on Waverly where the La Biancas were slain at the Zebulon Theater, the 30th anniversary showing of my film, Charles Manson Superstar, was held. And it actually premiered in Los Angeles on August 10th, 1989, which was the 20th anniversary of the murders. And so I was there on the 50th to show the film again. And it was a sold out event. And afterwards, I gave a lecture concentrating particularly uh, uh, the title of the lecture is What Hollywood Doesn't Want You to Know About the Manson Murders or Once Upon a Lie in Hollywood. And I addressed the the very odd and cryptic messages that I think Tarantino was concealing and hinting at in his film, which is maybe something we can touch on. So the lecture was very well received. The exhibit was very well received. And as a sign of how things have changed in the 50th anniversary, the Los Angeles Times, which, you know, I would think many of your listeners would know, was perhaps the principal purveyor of the cover up of what the Manson murders, so called, were really all about. Because the Los Angeles Times reporters, Dial Torgerson and Jerry Cohen, are who participated with Lawrence Schiller in putting across Susan Atkins' fake confession. And the Los Angeles Times, although they did do some decent reporting, getting into the drug dealing of Wojtek Frakowski and all of that sort of thing, at, at first, really the Los Angeles Times really for decades has pushed Helter Skelter and Bugliosi and, you know, the, the mindless disciples of a cult leader killing at his orders and the, and the, basically the cover story. So what was interesting is the Los Angeles Times, of all mainstream sources, interviewed me and included clips of this interview in their documentary that's online called uh, L.A. in the Time of Manson. Now, they cut out some of the more alarming revelations that I made, but even the fact that they would include me in it, it was fairly unprecedented considering that I've been treated as a pariah and a lunatic or a Manson apologist for years. So that the Times would not only include me 
with the usual talking heads who were just saying the usual things about Manson, but also that they recommended in their article on the 50th anniversary that, you know, that people attend the screening of my film. But that shows not so much on a personal level, but just in general, there's been a massive transformation of how the media presents this and how the general public is looking at it since the death of Manson and that it's finally, you know, being put in some sort of normal historical context rather than treated like, you know, the, the uniquely hysterical way that it is and, and sensational way that it's always been treated. And, um, sort of as a follow up to that 50th anniversary, um, lecture that I gave in Los Angeles, I will be in London, Bristol, and Manchester doing a UK speaking tour on November uh, 18th in London, November 19th, which is the second anniversary of Charlie's passing in Bristol, and on the 20th in Manchester. And um, yeah, I'll be giving a lecture entitled The Charles Manson Conspiracy at those three events in London. And that too is part of the 50th anniversary. And to uh, cut you off at the past, yes, the Manson file final ultimate edition is being laid out and pasted up right now. Nice, and tomorrow nice. I'm meeting with the um, gentleman who's doing the layout and graphics to finalize it all. So that will be in your hands and in the hands of your listeners as soon as we can possibly arrange that. Excellent. But that's ready to go. So that was at least my personal participation in the 50th anniversary. But I think we should discuss how the whole case how 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 the public and the media and even mainstream books and films are changing the way they look at it after all these decades. Well, because I've been pattering you about this on on the episodes that we've done in the past, I have to ask, is there a more specific timetable for the release? Yeah, this 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 month is what we're hoping for. We it's it's really like just just a few more. I had hoped to get it available but even for for the people that are attending the London, Bristol, and Manchester events, but I'm not sure it will be ready then, but we were aiming to do that. So it will be, you know, within within weeks, we're aiming to get it done. Are you, or is there any part of you that's at all surprised how much interest, how much public interest there still is in the Tate-LaBianca murders and Charles Manson? No, not really, because I just because I personally just receive a bombardment of proof of the public interest every day, you know, through personal correspondence and people giving me information and asking questions about it from every imaginable field. So to a certain degree, of course, it's like a niche interest, but I can see the massive uh, public interest in this has never died down and, and it seems to have only grown since Manson's death, because I mean, I think there's maybe a little bit of burnout from some of the rather mediocre TV documentaries that there've been just to cash in on the 50th anniversary, but the interest has not subsided a bit. And I, I would say it, uh, in the late nineties, it sort of seemed to be dissipating, but you know, as, as a witness of, of the way this phenomenon has developed, um, I, th- I think it's at an all time high now. And I think, I think people are finally realizing that they've been lied to, even though maybe only in a subtle way, at least they sense that there was a lot more to the story than they ever knew. And of course, now that most of the major players are not in this world anymore, it's slowly little fragments of the truth, but also fragments of disinformation to counter the truth are surfacing. Well, I think the biggest media story regarding the case this year may have been the release of Tom O'Neill's Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the Secret History of the 60s. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the most used talking points when discussing O'Neill's work, talking points by the media, was that O'Neill had been working on this for 20 years. Now, I do not mean to demean 20 years of research. That is an incredible amount of time to spend on one story, just doggedly chasing the story. That is two decades of work. That is amazing. 
But I know that you've been working on this intensively for even longer than that. Now, in fact, O'Neill even came to you at one point and you guys shared some exchanges. Right. So before I ask you to discuss chaos and the research as a book, take us, if you will, through your interactions with Tom O'Neill. Mm hmm. Right. Well, yeah, just to because I, you know, I don't want to pretend that I'm in any way objective about this because I just off the off the bat want to say I knew Tom very well from 1999 when he first contacted me and Zena to interview us about at that time he had been assigned by preview magazine, which is a now defunct movie magazine, like entertainment weekly, something of that ilk, uh, to write something for the 30th anniversary of the Manson murders. Again, that's a misnomer, but that's what they call them. What he wanted to get into at that time was what, what what was the real connection between Charlie and the celebrities and the beautiful people and how much was covered up of how many uh, famous rock stars and movie personalities that Charlie actually knew. Um, and so that was what the purview of this article that he had been assigned to write was. So we met him in 1999 at El Coyote Restaurant, which was the restaurant where Sharon Tate, Sebring, Furkowski, and Folger had their infamous last meal before returning to Cielo Drive later that night. And we survived the bad Mexican food, and we got along quite well. And at that time, I had already learned what the murders were basically about. I had learned from Ferdinand Main and Jean Gutowski, who had you know, opened up to us about the fact that everyone in Polanski circle knew that Wojtek Furkowski was a drug dealer. And of course, Jay Sebring was one of the main drug dealers known as the candy man to the Hollywood elite. And that uh, a drug delivery had been made that night and that the murders were a consequence of a, you know, an argument between people they knew, drug dealers who, who rival drug dealers. And everyone knew that in the Hollywood world. All, all of the rock and movie industry people as, who were part of what was known facetiously by the people involved in it as the Roman Circus or the Roman Empire. In other words, the friends of Roman Polanski and his hedonistic playboy world that he was in at that time um, literally playboy world involved with Hugh Hefner. And that's what we discussed. And I gave Tom information about how Sebring had cleared out or no, how Steve McQueen, sorry, Steve McQueen had supervised the clearing out of drugs from J. Sebring's house after the murders. And, you know, we got, we got into all the celebrity connections at that time. In 1999, I was not interested in writing another book about the case, and not even I even thought, well, I don't even want to take on the trouble and all the controversy I will have to deal with if I get into this. So I was more than happy to say, here is some information, not all. I didn't reveal confidential sources, as I still refuse to do. People who've spoken to me in confidence and who don't, do not want their names revealed to this day out of fear and dread. But, you know, we gave him quite a lot of information pointing in that direction and, you know, very convivial and cordial and he pursued it. And I was only too glad to give my blessing. Please, you know, here's this, go look into it, find out what you can find. Maybe with preview magazine that would have the clout to get people like Jane Fonda, Warren Beatty, Peter Fonda, you know, many other celebrities to maybe speak a little more openly about this. And of course, they refused to speak to him. And then he started to see that something was being covered up. And then uh, I moved to Germany and we remained in touch. And he he slowly started to reveal that the magazine article had mutated into a book project. And for the next 10 years, we remained in friendly I would say collegial contact, trading information on this and that to the degree that we could. And he told me of his travails, tracking down Linda Kasabian and Steve Grogan and 
you know, the people that he had interviewed and tried to get interviews from. And then there was a point where he became convinced that there were many more unsolved murders, um, which is covered in chaos, which I do not believe. I, I think there may be one or two that were involved in killing people who may have been too knowledgeable about the nature of what the crimes were. But he was starting to develop the theory that there, there were many more murders and that, and this took almost 10 years, really, as far as I could tell, before it m- mutated into a book about mind control and brainwashing, which was not at all where he began when he started to research this. And I, I like him personally, so I'm not saying this is some sort of personal critique, but about 10 years ago, we got into a fairly heated argument because he told me that he had proof on film of some sort of Tex uh, proving to me that Tex Watson was the mind controlled slave of Charles Manson. And that basically, I mean, here's an odd thing is he was basically confirming Vincent Bugliosi's theory that the killers were brainwashed by Manson and that they, they were his, you know, like robots, remote control murderers. And I said, I don't believe that. I don't think any of the evidence supports that. And we got into quite a heated argument about it. And he was more hostile at that point to my sympathy and friendship with Charles. So there was a change in his approach to this. And so we drifted out of contact after this argument. And I I've written to him as recently as August. We were going to meet in Los Angeles because for me to review the book properly, because the book Chaos is so completely different than what he presented the book that he was writing years ago, 10 years ago, to be that I was shocked at how much it focused on this CIA mind control speculation and how much it did not get into the drug dealing and the narcotics trafficking as being the center of what these crimes were about. So I wanted to speak to him before I wrote about the Manson, I mean, before I wrote about chaos in the new edition of the Manson file, because I review the crop of, of more significant books that have come out about the case. And actually, he had to attend the funeral of the of the young woman uh, the Ken- in the Kennedy family who recently killed herself. I don't remember her hard to pronounce Irish name, but you may know what I mean. So that's. So we couldn't meet while I was in Los Angeles, but, you know, I, I did reach out to say, you know, is it Dan Pieperberg that changed the book? Was it the publisher that refused to get into the drug dealing angle? You know, I wanted, I, I wanted to assume maybe he didn't have complete control over how this book came out because it was just so radically different than where it seemed to begin and, and so completely convinced of the CIA angle, which I am resolutely not even slightly convinced of. So I, you know, I wanted to speak to him. I have not been able to, I hope that I will be able to, but, uh, so that was our personal relationship and we just for a decade together. Um, and I'm, I was, you know, so I was looking forward to, and I congratulated him on the book, even though I don't agree with many of its conclusions, uh, I have to say he did do excellent work in unearthing certain facts, things that had been speculated about. He proved them by finding the paperwork that absolutely proves some of Bugliosi's lies. And I mean, I, I think, you know, after your next question, maybe I should go into what I think he did unearth and reveal in chaos that is very significant to the case. And those things have largely been missed by the media. Those things have been ignored because for the most part, the public and the media has focused on the CIA brainwashing angle, but there are aspects that he did reveal, which are significant. So I'd I'd like to get into them too. 
Sure, yes, and that's part of why we're here tonight. Now, my favorite review of this book today, the, my favorite review of Chaos, has been the one that Jim DiEugenio did at KennedysandKings.com. I think it's really sharp. And it's a two-part review, which I think is very fitting because Jim makes the case that it's almost two books in one. You know, first, you have the tearing down of Vincent Bugliosi and the Helter Skelter mythology. And then second, you have the whole CIA mind control aspect. Now, Jim had very high praise for the first part and... I guess I would use the word lukewarm to describe the praise for the second. But in Tom O'Neill's defense, he did say publicly that he waited this long to publish because he absolutely wanted to prove the CIA connections. He wanted to prove the mind control angles. But in the end, he just couldn't. So right. he ended up reporting what he found without really stating any sort of definitive motive. And, and then he sort of just lets the reader take it from there and assume or link – as they wish. But he did say that he didn't find any conclusive proof of mind control. Well, it's, that's, that's true. But the way it has been presented, yes, he himself admits he didn't come to a firm conclusion. Let, let me put the whole thing, uh, the overview of how what I think is valuable and what is very misleading about the book. And I personally tend to think it must be the publisher and Dan Piepenberg, the co-writer who inherited the task of organizing this massive manuscript into a publishable product that could be sold to the mainstream audience. I would like to think that it must be tampering and interference from those two parties that led to the kind of, I, I think the book is strangely structured and does not convey a clear message. I think it is very oddly put together and and you know it, it's it's not clear in communicating, and that seems to me like too many cooks spoiled the brew. Um, what was significant that he revealed about Bugliosi was how Alta, Rudy Altabelli, the owner of Cielo Drive, and Terry Melcher were absolutely proven in the book to be colluding together in a conspiracy to conceal how well Terry Melcher knew Manson. Now that is very important, but now, and let me ask you this because you've read the book too. On one hand, absolutely. Tom tears apart Bugliosi, which was great. And he shows what a megalomaniac, narcissistic liar and, and how willing he was to, to be vindictive against anyone who challenged him. That's all great. And he, you know, he explained to a mainstream audience these things that Manson aficionados have known for decades about, you know, his neurotic behavior, think, thinking that a milkman was having an affair with his wife and his violent treatment of women, all that sort of thing. It, it's to Tom's credit that he's revealed that to a mainstream audience. So he did conclusively prove through talking to Altabelli and... Bugliosi and Melcher, that they conspired to perjure themselves in court, that they lied about how well Melcher knew Charlie. And he even, it's mentioned just in passing that Melcher actually recorded Charlie, which is a very important thing because the whole legend and myth is based on the lie that Melcher didn't really like Charlie's music and refused to record him. But I don't know if you even noticed it because it just sort of like many very important things in the book. It's just kind of run through in passing in one paragraph and not gone into in detail. And actually some of the most important things, which again, to Tom's credit, they're hidden in the, uh, in the footnotes at the back of the book. For instance, he, has Stephen K. admitting something that I made clear in the Manson file, uh, you know, over 10 years ago, that um, the story about Dennis Wilson meeting Charlie through Gary Hinman, that, has, that was never clarified before or understood. Most people have heard this fairy tale about how Dennis Wilson picked up some of Charlie's girls hitchhiking and that that was how he met. But actually, Stephen K. is cited, the prosecutor, one of the prosecutors, Bugliosi's 
sort of reluctant right-hand man at the trial um, revealed himself, but this is hidden in tiny print in the footnote. And that was very frustrating. But here you have one of the major pushers of the Helter Skelter myth and that, and that Dennis Wilson and Melcher really didn't know Charlie that well. Uh, that whole legend here, he's admitting that Gary Hinman was the connection between Manson and Dennis Wilson. And that of course is very significant to how deeply enmeshed in the murders in general, Dennis Wilson and the Beach Boys were. But uh, it's significant. A lot of the important things that I thought were of, of significance were just hidden in, you know, just glossed over very quickly. Or, for instance, it mentions again in the back of the book that Steve Parent, the 18-year-old boy who was murdered there, it just says there was a lot more to that murder than has been known. And that's it. Doesn't explain it. So that was very frustrating to me as somebody that knows the details of the whole case. I thought, why going into the CIA but ignoring the meat of the true story of the whole Manson saga? And that that's what I would say my main criticism is, are these two points. Is he he keeps saying that he's demolishing the Helter Skelter myth and legend, and yet does he really do that? No, because he is still buying Bugliosi's main wrong conclusion. And I don't even believe Bugliosi believed this, mind you. Let's put it another way. Uh, O'Neill pushes Bugliosi's main prosecutorial argument that Charlie brainwashed these people to kill. And I am saying that is categorically untrue. They killed on their own for their own reasons. These were totally ordinary crimes in the drug dealing milieu. There was no brainwashing or hypnosis involved. Charlie had no hypnotic powers. It was not a cult. It was a group of misfits who basically got into desperate financial straits and committed a crime. But it, it, you know, so the first thing I completely reject the idea that there was any brainwashing, that there was any mind control. So then when we get deeper down the rabbit hole into the idea that this has to do with the MK Ultra plot, that, that Manson somehow learned at the Haight Ashbury Free Clinic through Louis Jolion West from MK Ultra how to brainwash people. I completely reject it because it isn't, isn't that what Bugliosi is saying that the, that it was all about brainwashing. So I find it very confusing because on one hand, chaos says Helter Skelter wasn't true. And yet it takes the basic plank of Bugliosi's argument that Manson, you know, was a hypnotic hippie cult leader who brainwashed these people to kill. And I just reject that categorically. So, the whole idea, and it's very specious, the, the evidence presented to, the, I mean, what, if you haven't read the book, any of you out there listening, basically the whole thing is based on this idea that MK Ultra had a significant part to play in the, at least the Cielo Drive murders is based on the very weak, uh, fact that Louis Jolien West, a CIA official who was involved in MK Ultra, that's a historical fact, worked at the Haight Ashbury Free Clinic where Susan Atkins and Charlie and other members of the commune went. Well, there's no proof they ever met. There's no proof they had any dealings with each other. And furthermore, since I'm saying there was no brainwashing, Tex Watson and Linda Kasabian went out that night on their own volition. There was no hypnosis or mind control involved. So that's the key point that I have to underscore and that I find people get sort of lose the forest for the woods here. There was no CIA mind control because there was no mind control period. Charlie was not some hypnotic. I mean, I'm talking about a person I knew for 33 years. He would just find it laughable. And I find it ridiculous to think he, he was not a joiner. He was not a follower. This is not someone who would cooperate 
with any organization, let alone the CIA or the FBI. So, you know, I have to put it on that personal basis. But again, the main thing is, where is the proof that these murders were committed because of mind control and brainwashing? I think that that is the, the most ridiculous part of Bouliosi's claims. And I don't think that chaos actually refutes them. So, so what did you think of that part? I mean, doesn't it basically say this was about brainwashing? So how does it really debunk Helter Skelter? That's my point. Well, having had the benefit of our six hours of discussions and having really looked into this case more than the average American, I would guess, as I read chaos, as I did over a span of uh, about four or five days, I always had our conversations at the back of the mind. So like Jim, I was sort of, you know, celebrating that victory lap, stomping all over Bugliosi's career and his image. But then I got to the mind control angle and I was, like Jim, much more skeptical. But early on, O'Neill tells this story of reporter Mary Nicewander coming into a severe conflict with Bugliosi, with Bugliosi. You know, she was very critical of his work and very critical with how he dealt with witnesses. And he threatens her directly and he says, you know, I know where your kids go to school and it would be very easy to plant narcotics in their lockers. And I mean, I just dumbfounded. You know, that and the Susan Atkins story, which we'll discuss later, you know, those were things about Bugliosi that I think everyone should know. Everyone with even a minor interest in this story, they should know those stories. And Helter Skelter was the biggest selling true crime book of all time. We can't, we can't forget that. But now we all have to sort of collectively ask why, because the true in true crime, it wasn't true right. at all. Right. No, this is very... No, it's very important that he finally revealed what a vindictive piece of crap uh, and, you know, litigious and maniacal in defending his reputation and using any underhanded methods. And this is largely why so much of the untruths and lies have prevailed over the years, because people were frightened of Bugliosi and others like him coming after them to, to smear their reputation if he dared, if anyone dared to impugn his helter skelter theory, which was the base, but so yes, it does reveal him personally. Another flaw that I see, I mean, I know probably I'm too deep into it. And so, yes, it's definitely some progress to finally reveal on a personal level, what an awful human being and how unreliable Bugliosi was and the extent he would go in his mendacity. That is important and, and he'll never recover from that. And as I'll get into, there have been other attacks on Bugliosi from other quarters. The problem with it is it doesn't get, it, it makes it sound like Bugliosi was only an arrogant egomaniac who just couldn't let go of his false theory of Helter Skelter. I believe it is more sinister than that. I mean, I'm quite sure of it. I don't believe it. Bugliosi was given a task to do. Bugliosi, in my opinion, was the front man for a much deeper, true conspiracy, not, in a, not on an insane, sensational conspiracy theory level. He was the front man for an attempt to conceal the drug dealing that was going on at Cielo Drive and deeper the narcotics trafficking, trafficking and criminal network that was involved with movie studios with managers of rock bands. He was the entertainment industry's shill, and he had a job to do. I believe Bugliosi also went out of his way, and actually Paul Watkins, one of the commune members, mentioned this in passing in the book Life with Charles Manson, that Bugliosi actually was aware of Lino LaBianca's mafia connections, and what Charlie maintained to me always through all these decades was that he didn't hate Bugliosi and didn't even have any personal animus against him. He saw Bugliosi as a mafia tool who had been put in there to cover up what the murders were about. And so he didn't even resent them. He, he saw them as both being on the same different sides of the criminal street. What he didn't like was that Bugliosi, he felt Bugliosi betrayed him 
by pushing this ridiculous helter skelter legend. And then this is something we should get into too. The fact is Charlie did not do a lot to counter that himself because in my view, after all these years, my conclusion is Bugliosi and Manson in a bizarre way work, both worked together to conceal what these crimes were about in their own way. They, nobody involved wanted anyone to know the truth about what really happened. Yes, so, and that's really always been hard for me to understand. Why did Charles Manson not spend more time factually debating the Helter Skelter myth? I don't I can't give you the conclusive answer to that, and I write about it in detail in the new Manson file, what my final conclusions about what his motives and actions were. Number one, he it's true, as many people have pointed out that he followed the old underworld criminal code, that you do not snitch on what other criminals did. You don't get into it. You don't talk about it. You don't reveal it. And I think that is certainly true. And I think I think there were many more people involved as beneficiaries of these crimes than we know. That's one thing. And he hinted at that, and he, he you know, as directly as he would in his metaphoric way, implied that, he was not going to speak about what really happened because he would be killed in prison if he had during the early days of his incarceration. So there were other levels of these crimes that were concealed. They weren't, I do not believe they had anything to do with the government or the central intelligence agency. They had to do with organized crime and drug dealing period. That is every, from these decades of looking into this. I've never seen evidence pointing to anything else. And that's even what people close to Polanski have told me. So, you know, to me, that's not a theory. That's, that's what I know to be true from Charlie and from people involved with Tate, Sebring, Furkowski, and Folger directly, not secondhand, directly. So, Bulio sees a more sinister character, in my mind, than O'Neill presents him as a kind of arrogant buffoon but who was he working for? Who was Bugliosi working for? What was his mission? Why did he so hysterically and, and tenaciously hang on to this lie? And then you got to get into something that's not even mentioned in the book. I find it strange that if you're going to get into the CIA connection to this case, the CIA connection is to Vincent Bugliosi in that Bugliosi dedicated the greater part of his life to demolishing the idea that Lee Harvey Oswald was part of a conspiracy and, you know, and pushing the lone nut idea that Oswald acted alone. That is a very significant part of Bugliosi's life that chaos doesn't mention at all, which is weird because we now know that Bugliosi actually had correspondence with and apparently set up a meeting in London with one of the main CIA officers who is believed to have been Lee Harvey Oswald's handler, which I'm sure you remember because we've discussed that privately. So that, you know, this make this makes Bugliosi much more a tool of governmental and organized crime and entertainment industry forces I I don't think he was acting on his own. I think he was an ambitious person whose ego allowed him to be manipulated into this role. But why ignore Bugliosi's intense role as a defender of the Warren Commission and a supposed debunker of any so-called conspiracy theory suggesting that John F. Kennedy died as the result of a conspiracy, which I think any sane person based on the evidence has to conclude why is that not in chaos because that is the real cia connection here who was bugliosi working for why did he dedicate his life to uh you know his ridiculous book which anyone who knows anything about the jfk case has to find laughable i think those are significant factors that are missing so while it, it does show us the human failings and weaknesses and, and lying of Bugliosi, I don't think it really gets deeply enough into just how uh, troubling a figure he really is when you think about who 
you know, qui bono, the old Latin question, who, who gains, who benefits from all this? Why did he dedicate his life to this scapegoating of Manson and of Oswald, the two main scapegoat fall guys of the 60s? What, why was he given that role? I think that's a significant question to pose. So who were sort of playing Geppetto to Bugliosi's Pinocchio? Do we have specific names? Yes, yes. Uh, I, th- I think I know their names. Robert Evans, who died just recently, and this is a significant factor in the whole drama of the 50th anniversary. Robert Evans, for the producer in the 60s and 70s, who took over Paramount Studios production under the mentorship of his padroni, Sidney Korshak who was one of the most powerful mafia attorneys in the world and who was basically Bugsy Siegel's replacement as the East Coast mob's man in Hollywood. Who I, I can tell you the names. The people who orchestrated the cover-up of the at least the Cielo Drive and La Bianca, what, what these murders were really about, the people who were really involved with the cover-up were on from different angles, Evel Younger, Sidney Korshak definitely came in at the moment that Polanski returned from London after his wife was murdered. Sidney Korshak was right there at Paramount Studios conniving with Robert Evans to conceal what really happened. Evel Younger, from the judicial point of view, had supervised the Sirhan Sirhan trial, which you know, we have to remember that the RFK murders had just happened a year before, and he, Def Evel Younger, definitely helped to frame Sirhan Sirhan and to, with his co pro connections and as a crony of Nixon and Reagan, Evel Younger, I believe, pushed the angle, which people misunderstand, of blackening the reputation of the counterculture and the hippie movement after the fact of the murders, not orchestrating the murders to smear the hippie movement, but after Manson had been revealed to be involved with these crimes, used him as a scapegoat for the agenda of the Nixon and Reagan administration. So I think Evel Younger, Sidney Korshak, and Robert Evans were the main figures who had the power and the pull with the media, with the judiciary, to pull strings to make sure that the story was presented the way they wanted it to be presented. And I don't think there's any doubt. I'm sure there were other names we may never know, but as far as people powerful enough in Los Angeles to to push this agenda, I think they they are the... um, trinity of evil, so to speak, who were behind the whole cover-up. And I think the general public doesn't understand that when they are decrying Manson as a cult leader and as the scum of the earth and someone who hypnotized innocent middle-class children to kill for him, they are being distracted by the misdirection of criminals themselves, like Korshak. Evans, who was involved in the Cotton Club murders, of course, and was himself a cocaine trafficker like his friend Jay Sebring, and Evel Younger, who was known even by people who admired him as Evil Younger for his underhanded, unethical behavior. So to me, that's not a mystery. Those are the three figures who had something to gain and who had the clout and power to to put across this conspiracy cover story that has lasted this long. But now that Robert Evans has recently passed, there should be a chance that more people will talk about his involvement. Yes, I do. I, I, there's not many people left because they, they're all around his age and they're, you know, late eighties. Most of the people directly involved, even Roman Polanski is now 84, 85. Um, there aren't many witnesses to what happened, but Evans bragged about his involvement in the cover-up, just as Gene Gutowski, Polanski's friend and producer and business associate, basically 
when he admitted these things to me, he didn't do it like, oh, how terrible it is. He was sort of proud of the fact that his friends had managed to push this reputation protecting cover story. I mean, he, these people were very cynical and amoral. Now, another very important factor which suggests that, yes, I do believe that with the passing of Robert Evans, some of his associates may be less afraid of being sued or killed because, let's face it, Robert Evans was known for arranging hits, and we don't know exactly, although I'm looking into this right now, what his role was in the murder of Roy Radin in the Cotton Club murders, which were very similar to the same drug-dealing milieu of what was going on at Cielo Drive with Furkowski and Sebring. Um, so now the, the significant factor I was referring to is, and this has been ignored by the mass media completely in the 50th anniversary, is that the gentleman who replaced Jay Sebring, who, who Sebring named as his successor, should he die, recently revealed to the Hollywood Reporter, which is far from a, a subversive conspiracy mongering Rag, but is in fact the Bible of the Hollywood establishment. In the Hollywood Reporter, J. Sebring's subordinate, the fellow who took over from Sebring as the head of Sebring International and his successor, admitted that he knew that Sebring was a drug dealer, that, as I mentioned in the Manson file, that he was known to all and sundry in the Hollywood elite as the candy man, and that he was certain that it had nothing to do with Helter Skelter, the murders, and that what he claimed was that there was a dispute between Manson, Sebring, and Furkowski about a cocaine delivery that led to Manson seeking revenge. I don't believe that's exactly true either by any means. That doesn't fit into anything I've learned. It doesn't mean that something like that didn't happen, but this is a, a huge breakthrough in it's not me, the crazy Manson apologist, saying this. This is a close business associate and friend of Jay Sebring saying he never believed in the helter-skelter race war theory. In The Hollywood Reporter, he's saying that Manson knew Sebring and Furkowski, which totally debunks the foundation of the cover-up, which the murderers and Bugliosi and everyone involved including the families of the victims and the members of the commune. All of the different players in this drama have all conspired to make it seem that Sebring and Furkowski did not know anyone in the commune, especially Tex and Charlie. And that's just not true. So this is probably one of the most significant breakthroughs that we've seen. I would say more than chaos, although chaos is important and Tom deserves credit for what he did reveal, that revelation from someone that close to Sebring is pretty conclusive of what I've been saying all these years, that everyone in that circle who knew Sebring, Furkowski, Folger, and Tate knew what these crimes were about and went along with the cover-up. And in fact, as I get into in the Manson file, they were guilty of obstruction of justice because they knew, I think, many of them who was behind the murders and because they were frightened or, or were hoping they wouldn't be arrested because they were hoping their names would not be dragged into it. They did not go to the police and even talk about this. So th that, that's a very significant factor that's been strangely, although every little detail of this case, you know, gets echoed in the media and picked up by other news stories, this very recent August 2019 story about Sebring's successor admitting it was about drugs, that Sebring was a drug dealer, and that the victims knew Manson, at least. That's a huge breakthrough. That is a huge breakthrough. Correct. Now, you mentioned earlier that you believe that Quentin Tarantino was leaving hints mm -hmm. within Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, as poor of a film as that was. What were those hints, and why do you think he left them? Well, in my lecture in Los Angeles, where, where I brought this 
message to the belly of the beast, Hollywood itself. There, there's several. For one thing, um, I know that Tarantino knew people who are aficionados and connoisseurs of the case who do not believe in Helter Skelter. I happen to know from personal experience that he knows people very well who have the information to provide to him that Helter Skelter or cult leader hypnosis was not what the Tate LaBianca murders were about. Secondly, as a protege of Harvey Weinstein, so I, I don't think I have to say anything more to make it clear about his character and unreliability, Tarantino is deeply enmeshed in the Hollywood establishment. He's looked at as this rebel uh, bad boy of the cinema, but in fact, he's you know completely enmeshed in the most conservative power center of the Hollywood elite, and he has been for decades. So someone that comes from Weinstein's circle is not going to reveal Hollywood's ugliest secret, which is the truth about the Cielo Drive murders. But what he did do in the film, which I personally detested and found in every way, you know, unconscionable, aesthetically in every way. I know many people disagree with me, but I guess knowing what I know about it and knowing what he could have revealed and how cowardly that film really is, the hints that I'm referring to, which I mentioned in my talk in L.A. in August, are these, is that for some reason, he includes the characters Steve McQueen, Mama Cass, Michelle Phillips is seen briefly, and let's just take, I mean, because I, I can't explore the whole thing in the time allotted here, but why include Steve McQueen in this film? There's a brief scene where Steve McQueen is watching Sebring and Tate dancing, if you remember that. And McQueen was at the center of the cover-up of Sebring's drug dealing. As I mentioned to you earlier in this interview, McQueen supervised having Sebring's receptionist and another young woman that Polanski knew go to Jay Sebring's villa and clear out all of his drugs before the police came and so that they couldn't figure out what the murders were really about. And perhaps for his own gain, because who I haven't been able to discover who sold this copious amount of drugs and where did that go. But I believe that Tarantino used McQueen because he knows that. And everyone in, in the Hollywood elite knows of Steve McQueen's role in the Manson murder cover-up. It's, it's even mentioned by Colonel Paul Tate in his memoirs. And certainly Colonel Paul Tate, Sharon Tate's father, was not you know, a conspiracy theorist. He even knew that Steve McQueen did that. Uh, Vincent Bugliosi even mentions it briefly in Helter Skelter, though doesn't make, doesn't connect the dots. So it's well known in Hollywood lore that Steve McQueen was deeply involved in the cover up of Sebring's death. And that's why I think Tarantino includes him as a visual reference. But again, in a cowardly way, he, why not get into the truth about this thing after 50 years? It's because I think Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is propaganda for Hollywood to again make it look like Hollywood itself was innocent and sweet and utopian and this evil. I mean, the way the Manson commune is presented in the film is ludicrous. It's like in a 70s horror film about witches, the way that the girls in the commune were presented in the brief scene where Brad Pitt goes to the Spawn Ranch. The way they were presented is nothing like their actual behavior and comportment. It, it was, you know, it was, it was more out of uh, like the mood of a B horror movie from that time. So I see the film as propaganda for Hollywood and yet another concealment of the facts. And the other thing I'll mention is Tarantino, including Cass Elliot or Mama Cass, as her nickname was, the singer from the Mamas and the Papas, who knew Char Charlie very, very well, and knew Susan Atkins, and who had the commune often at her house, where Frakowski and Folger and Tate and Sebring were frequent guests. She was a 
major connecting point between the worlds of the Spawn Ranch and Cielo Drive, he also has Mama Cass briefly in there. Now, as Mama Cass admitted to the songwriter Jimmy Webb, who wrote many of the most famous hits of the 60s, and it was a rumor I'd heard going back to the 1980s, but it was confirmed by Webb recently, that Mama Cass had gone to the Cielo Drive house that night to score drugs very late in the night, early in the morning rather, and had stumbled upon the bodies, freaked out, and left without, of course, notifying the cops. But she did notify all her friends what had happened. And of course, she knew what, you know, that it was about a drug deal. As she, now she believed it was these Canadian drug dealers who Tex Watson was actually trying to frame for the murders. And I've mentioned them in, in previous broadcasts, uh, Harrigan and Pick Dawson, especially. So why would Tarantino include McQueen and Cass? I think he was hinting at his knowledge of these fairly well-known pieces of Hollywood folklore. In the three episodes that you and I have done, we've talked about some of the horrible depictions of both Charles Manson and the family, the so-called family. And there have been multiple terrible documentaries, terrible biopics. Mm -hmm. And I just have to ask this because it interests me at, at some level of bad. Right. I'd like to know the worst. When was that moment when you said, oh, this one is the worst I've ever seen? I, w I, have, I have to say, I think those scenes at the Spawn Ranch in Tarantino's film were some of the most ludicrous and laughable I've ever seen. And their exaggerated, witchy portrayal of the women, you know, turning them into these menacing horror figure characters. But uh, to me, there's not a doubt that actually the, the worst of all the movies about the case is probably the one most people know best and who love best is the Helter Skelter TV movie from mm -hmm. 1976. Right. I mean, to me, that is a laughably bad piece of propaganda. And of course, to most people, they think that's the truth. In fact, you know, most illiterate people couldn't get through Bugliosi's book. What they know of the case comes from that movie. So I would say the Helter Skelter movie from 76 is one of the worst. Now, I have to admit, I, ha I am so sick of the exploitation of Charlie in these films I haven't seen Charlie Says. I saw a little bit of it. Do you know about that? Yes, but I haven't seen it. Yeah, I, just, I saw little bits of it, and that sort of takes a, a uh, politically correct feminist take on Manson as the privileged white male dominating the the women. It has, you know, it has a very politically correct neo-feminist flavor, and it also is laughable. It doesn't capture the Manson I knew, but of course... You know, if uh, watching films about someone you know very well, it's it's not believable. It's not credible. So I admit I come from a very slanted source. I've uh, now actually recently Mind Hunters, and I don't I don't follow the mainstream media whatsoever. I only hear about this from people who are caught up in it. But uh, I guess it's a popular television show in America. I don't know if you're familiar with it. They recently had the same actor who played Manson in Tarantino's film, play Manson again in an episode of Mindhunters, in which they sort of hinted that maybe he wasn't as involved with the crime and that Tex Watson maybe had more to do with it. There was some subtle suggestion of that. So that is part, again, of not a completely satisfying, but at least noticeable trend of moving away from Helter Skelter. But yeah, as far as the worst Manson movie, I'd have to say the most damaging and, you know, laughable is definitely the 76 production of Helter Skelter, the TV movie. From the crimes that horrified the world. <gasps> oh my God, From the best-selling book that revealed every true and bloody detail. Now comes the motion picture that has already shocked 100 million Americans.
Charles Manson, the father, his family, and their legacy of helter-skelter. Now, Lorimar Productions brings to full life Helter Skelter, the number one bestseller, the true story of the Charles Manson murders. I just kept stabbing her to stop screaming. I just wanted them to stop! If you don't stop, I'll have you removed. I've got a little system. Call the next witness. Do you think I'm kidding? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Sharon Tate, Jay Sebring, Abigail Folger, Wojciech Frykowski, Stephen Parent, Lino LaBianca, and Rosemary LaBianca are not here with us now in this courtroom. But from their graves... They cry out for justice. You have just judged yourself. The world had never before witnessed anything like the Manson family. And God help us all if there's anything like it ever again. You say there are just a few? Well, there are many, many more. And they're running in the streets. They're all running in the same direction. And they're running right at you. Helter Skelter. The true story. The whole story. The true story and the whole story. You know, it wouldn't surprise me at all if Vincent Bugliosi demanded that both of those lines were in the trailer. That is, by the way, the trailer for the 1976 film, which Nicholas just described. A truly terrible trailer for a truly terrible film. And I'm talking to Nicholas Schreck, the author of The Manson File, the director of Charles Manson's Superstar. And we decided to take some questions tonight for this episode. We haven't really done that before, so we wanted to start doing that in our episodes from here on. So we have a few here from the fine people at the Education Forum. Now, the first one tonight is from author Jim DiEugenio, the author of Destiny Betrayed. Uh Now, Nicholas, Jim wants to know more about how Vincent Bugliosi duped Susan Atkins. Well, one of the core reasons that by any standards of judicial legality and justice that the trial should have been made a mistrial immediately was that Susan Atkins was given a public defender, you know, she was assigned a public defender when she was arraigned for the for involvement in the Gary Hinman murder. And then it started to come out because of testimony from another girl, a uh, girlfriend of Bobby Beausoleil named Kitty Lutzinger, that Atkins must have, the things that she had told Kitty Lutzinger made it clear to the detectives that this connected to the Cielo crime and not only the Hinman crime. So she was assigned a public defender, but then the court changed that public defender and gave her Paul Caruso and Richard Caballero, two mafia lawyers who were deeply connected to the drug dealing milieu and would some would actually had represented Joel Rostow, who delivered the drugs to Cielo Drive, who represented one of the Canadian drug dealers that supplied Wojtek Frakowski with the MDMA that he was selling that night that led to the murder. So this was a complete, you know, violation of vested interests in every way. Furthermore, Paul Caruso, who was a notorious, you know, lawyer for the mob, he had represented Mickey Cohen, uh, who was one of Manson's heroes and who Manson knew some of Cohen's subordinates, even in the sixties. So suddenly this penniless hippie, Susan Atkins is being represented by consigliere for the mob and and people deeply connected not only with drug dealers, which is what the case is all about, but Paul Caruso was a lawyer for the Los Angeles Times, which is reporting or misreporting the story. And in brief, because this this is a whole episode in itself, Caballero and Caruso with Atkins and and I'm sure with other shadowy personages who we may never know, probably with Bugliosi himself if you think about this, helping them to 
devise this story, sort of like Hollywood scriptwriters coming up with a narrative. How do we conceal that the victims knew the killers? And what they came up with was the basic story that Susan Atkins, her her faked confession, which was concocted in participation with Caruso and Caballero, that it was a random crime, that it was committed, as she said early on in her, her grand jury testimony, to shock the establishment. There was no mention of helter-skelter or race war or anything like that. So these two very corrupt mafia lawyers connected with people way too involved with the case and with the LA Times, they invented the cover story. And Susan Atkins then was sent out to, quote, confess this concocted fake story to other prisoners in the prison in the, in the jail where she was being held. And she went through many different prisoners who, who didn't report it to the authorities. What they wanted her to do was to confess this fake story to get it out there to the public. And finally, she found Ronnie Howard and Virginia Graham, two prostitutes who also had deep connections to the mafia. And I've interviewed Virginia Graham and her involvement with organized crime Frank Sinatra and Ronald Reagan. She was the the woman. So you have to understand the woman who reported the confession of Susan Atkins, her involvement in Cielo Drive, was a friend of Jay Sebring, a friend of Frank Sinatra. In other words, someone again like Caballero and Caruso, deeply involved in the Cielo Drive scene. So I believe that Graham was a plant. And she she was meant to then tell this confession to the authorities. And then this this whole facade, this whole farce was put into play. Then the grand jury testimony of Atkins was delivered. And Lawrence Schiller, one of we've spoken about him in other episodes, one of the sleaziest and most mysterious figures in the 20th century who was present in Dallas at Kennedy's assassination, or he was there right immediately after uh, to befriend Jack Ruby, uh, to get to know Oswald. And, you know, getting into Lawrence Schiller would be too complicated, but he became the conduit to sell Susan Atkins' story to the European and foreign press. And he put together with Dial Torgerson and Jerry Cohen, also people Jerry Cohen in particular, deeply involved as critics of the Warren Commission. So Schiller and Cohen colluded together to push this story of random killings that Susan Atkins told through the LA Times and through the international press. And early on in, you know, the the awareness of even who Charlie was, this book, The Killing of Sharon Tate, was published under Lawrence Schiller's name which basically got the cover story out to the public. And by any standard of a normal trial, here you have a defendant, her own lawyers, having her admit she's guilty and putting across information that would make it impossible to get a fair trial for Manson. Because in the killing of Sharon Tate and in that report, he is already presented as the manipulative cult leader who ordered them to kill so there was no way he could ever get a fair trial after that. And that was the point of this whole procedure. So the obscure names of Caballero and Caruso and Schiller need to be much higher up on people's radar. As significantly as Bugliosi in the plot. Bugliosi came along in a more prominent role a little bit later, though he was apparently already involved in these shenanigans. So you know, how can you imagine that happening today is, it, it, you know, it, it would be that it would be a mistrial. So I think that answers Jim's question that the from the very beginning of the trial. Now, the other thing is that Bugliosi promised Atkins if she went along with all this, that she would get some kind vaguely made promises that she would get preferential treatment or a lesser sentence or that sort of thing. And then as soon as Linda Kasabian 
came into the picture. Gary Fleischman, her lawyer, made a deal with Bugliosi, which he admitted in his in the most cynical, uh, amoral way. Gary Fleischman, Kasabian's attorney, admitted that Bugliosi really didn't like Atkins as as his main witness because she, you know, she she didn't look the part of a reliable, innocent person or a believable person. And Linda Kasabian had a more wholesome appearance, even though she was in fact one of the instigators with Tex Watson of the murders. So Gary Fleischman convinced Linda Kasabian to accept the deal that Bugliosi and Aaron Stovitz, the original prosecutor, offered her was, we will give you complete immunity for the crimes if you just go to court and repeat this story that Bugliosi has concocted. And Fleischman has admitted that that story was not true, that the story that Kasabian told them, you know, under the protection of attorney-client privilege had nothing to do with Helter Skelter or cult leading. It was, he admitted and has continued to admit it was a fiction, which the deal was Bugliosi and Stovitz said, you repeat this story and you get immunity. And so people are concerned about Bobby Beausoleil or Leslie Van Houten getting paroled in their seventies, you know, when they're harmless elderly people But they're not worried about the fact that Linda Kasabian has been out and still involved in the drug dealing milieu for decades. She's she's out there in Washington state. Uh, She's lived a free life. And she is, in fact, along with Tex Watson, the person responsible for the murders of these people, because she plotted it along with Watson to get revenge on Frakowski. So what could be a, a more atrocious miscarriage of justice than that. And of course, Atkins is not a sympathetic person to the public, but she was basically a a very young, confused woman with emotional problems that was manipulated by Caruso, Caballero, Schiller, and Bugliosi, and then betrayed once Kasabian showed up. It's sort of like casting for a Hollywood movie. Kasabian was uh, better for the role, so Atkins was thrown aside and Kasabian became this innocent hippie angel. But people should, I mean, the two things that maybe people should take away from this that they should be outraged about that I've mentioned is that is incredible, really. Kasabian, who's responsible for the crimes, is considered an innocent who who sort of reluctantly went along with it and then, um, you know, became a heroine because she turntables on Manson and and was responsible for his conviction through her false testimony. And the second thing I mentioned, which I think many more people should be aware of, is this recent revelation of Sebring's right-hand man and successor admitting that the victims knew the killers. Those two facts alone should be enough to make people angry and not complacent. And it goes way beyond just the fascination of the Manson case. It gets into the fact that lies of that stature corrode the public good. They destroy any ability to trust the judiciary or the government. And that is is much more significant to me than the specious claims of CIA mind control. What the way the LA courts colluded with the entertainment industry and organized crime tells you who controls the media, who decides what your opinion should be. And that is is a much more real and tangible fear that we should have about who runs our society, who manufactures our reality. Agreed. I absolutely agree. Now, these next few questions are from David Andrews. The first being this. What can Nicholas tell us about Manson or any other visitor coming to the Cielo Drive house after the Texas Watson murder party left? Yeah, in brief, uh, Charlie told me multiple times that he did, in fact, go back to the Cielo Drive house, outraged after he learned that Tex and the others that went with him had not cleared up any of the evidence or gotten rid of fingerprints. And the significant thing here is 
far from thinking, oh, good, you went out and followed my orders. When they came back to the ranch, he said to Susan Atkins something to the nature of, you stupid cunt, you have put me back into prison. So he and an associate who he never named, so I don't know if it's a male or a female at the ranch, or maybe someone not even that we know it's possible, though I have my suspicions of, of who it is likely to be, they went back to Cielo Drive, which Charlie knew and had been going to, you know, since 1968. It was a, a place very familiar to him. And he admitted to me how frightened he was going there, not knowing what he would face. And what exactly he did there, I can only speculate. I believe he must have had a lot to do with the rearrangement of the corpses and creating the scene that the police found. Although what I can gather, there were at least two returns that two different teams went back and that maybe other members of the commune were there, but I cannot prove that, that other people went to the crime scene. But Charlie's goal in going back there was not I mean, even this is a cover story, not to go to make sure he that they killed these people. That's not true. What he did is he went back to cover up the evidence and to disguise the nature of the crime. And he admitted that he left the glasses as a false clue that for a while were very distracting to the police. He admitted that he left a hand towel on the face of Jay Sebring. So, and I, I believe he did some dragging around of corpses and that kind of thing, though he did not admit that to me. But for instance, the anomaly of all of Sharon Tate's blood being on the porch, it seems to me, and I have no doubt from the descriptions of what the murders actually were, she was murdered outside and then brought back into the house and tied up in this uh, grotesque scenario with Jay Sebring as a way of showing their, uh, in reference to Sebring and Tate's S&M relationship to make it look like an inside job. So Charlie admitted that he went back to the house, told me that many times. A bizarre thing about that is when I first met him, he was very angry at Newell Emmons, who actually was the first to reveal that Charlie had gone back in his flawed but interesting book, Manson in His Own Words, which was published in 1987. And at that time, Charlie was really angry at Newell Emmons for printing that because he thought it was off the record. And then years later, when I went into much more detail of what he told me in the 2011 edition of my book, he had no problem with it at all. So I have no explanation for that mystery. But yes, he, he absolutely went back. And Stephanie Schramm, uh, brand new member of the commune that Charlie was very smitten with has admitted that Charlie came back at dawn to Spawn Ranch. And this was roughly an hour or so after one of the neighbors at Cielo Drive had overheard two men on the front lawn arguing very forcefully. And, and I have no doubt one of those men arguing was Charlie. And David would also like to know, and you discussed this a little bit, but maybe we can explore it a little further. He wants to know, had any members of the Tex Watson murder party been to the Cielo Drive house prior to the night of the murders? Oh, yes. Well, okay. The significant factor here is Charles Tex Watson was introduced to the prior tenant of Cielo Drive, Terry Melcher, the music producer and son of Doris Day in 1968 by Dennis Wilson, who was Tex Watson's friend as much as he was Charlie's friend. And it's been completely ignored because Tex Watson has been very strangely airbrushed out of this whole case that Charles Watson was allowed to stay at Cielo Drive in 1968 when Terry Melcher and Candace Bergen were living there and Mark Lindsay of Paul Revere and the Raiders. Um, and when Terry Melcher would be in Europe or away, he would let Tex Watson stay there. He was very good friends with him. And Tex Watson sold drugs from the guest house and the main house. And there's no dispute about that. I've, I've even talked to people who remember having met Tex Watson at Terry Melcher's house and buying pot and acid 
from him there. So that's the drug dealing milieu that we saw with Wojtek Frakowski and Sebring was already going on when Terry Melcher was living there and Tex Watson was the drug dealer at Cielo Drive. He didn't he didn't live there permanently because he basically floated around from the Spawn Ranch to Cielo to Dennis Wilson's house and and had several apartments in Hollywood and and elsewhere and on and on Wonderland Avenue where the Wonderland murders occurred. So yes, Tex Watson and Charlie knew Cielo Drive very well and most of the girls in the commune had been there many times during Melcher's residency. Now, how many times between February and August of 1969, which is when Polanski and Tate moved in there, how many times had Charlie or any of the girls or Tex been back there? I can't say, but I do know at least once, and that was when Linda Kasabian and Watson went there to make a deal with Wojtek Frakowski about this MDA that he apparently ripped them off about, and that that what was led to the murder. So Tex was a very familiar figure to everyone there. And also Rudy Altabelli knew Tex very well, according to a source that I, that I've spoken to recently who knew Altabelli. So yeah, that Watson and Manson at the very least, but many of the girls in the commune as well knew Cielo drive very well. And I'm glad you brought up Rudy Altabelli, actually, because David's last questions, well, it's kind of a three-part question, so I'll ask them all at once because they kind of go together. He asks, is there any truth to the rumor that Patricia Krenwickel lived for a time in the guest house with William Gerritsen? Why was William Gerritsen not harmed nor the guest house entered on the night of the murders? And did the Watson party or any other visitor assume Rudy Altabelli was inside? Okay, the I've looked into this very uh, persistent rumor that Patricia Krenwinkel, who used the maiden name of Texas mother, Montgomery, Patricia Montgomery, in an interview, it was mentioned that that Garrettson lived with a with a woman named someone named Patricia Montgomery or Patricia M something. And it has been speculated that that was Linda Kasabian. I have pretty much confirmed that that's not true. That, I'm sorry, Patricia Krenwinkel. And um, I've determined that's not true, that there is no proof that I have ever discovered that Krenwinkel knew Gerritsen. But that has been a, a very persistent rumor that I think is just based on a coincidence of names. So I don't think that's true. The question of why, when you consider that the facts of the matter of these murders is that they happened in a blind panic, everyone was killed so that there would be no witnesses to the murders, and that Charlie and others went back to the house to cover up evidence and make sure nobody could connect him to the crime, why in the world would they leave a witness to the whole thing alive? There is no answer to that. I don't have an answer to it. And it's one of the biggest, but maybe least explored and least thought about mystery of the whole case, because Charlie went back to the house and in the mood he was in, why would he leave? He knew the guest house. He knew Rudy Altabelli very well. He knew the layout of the house completely. How could he have not checked? It, it seems incomprehensible. So the questions are, what was the role of William Gerritsen in the murders? And even if he inadvertently was a collaborator with Tex Watson and Krenwinkel and Atkins, etc., which I have no proof that that's true, but some people have speculated that if he knew them, why would he be left alive? Even if they were sympathetic to him, because he could have been a witness to what happened. See, he, and his stories, William Garrettson, as your listener may know, are outrageous and ludicrous and, and just bordering on, on fantasy. His, he's a completely unreliable witness, sort of like Susan Atkins. Two of the main witnesses to this event are completely unreliable. So yeah, there, there's there, that's the thing. There are certain questions that cannot be answered. Why was Garrettson left alive by any criminal 
reason, you cannot think of a good reason to not check to make sure because they were back. Remember, they were the criminals were there between midnight and 4 a.m. Overall, they had ample opportunity to kill Garrison as well. And why why would they have killed Steve Parent, just a, a someone who happened to look in the window but not get rid of Garrison? Doesn't make any sense. But I have even after 30 something years, I have no idea why or how that happened. Were they assuming that Rudy Altobelli was inside? That I don't know. I, I know that I have no idea if they did, but I don't think they had any particular grudge against Rudy Altobelli. Manson knew Altobelli and got along with him and was involved with drug dealing and some other kind of criminal activity, which I believe may involve pornography. Um, he knew Altobelli very well. And Melcher and Altobelli were up to no good in the Cielo Drive house going back a year before that, 1968. I, I believe that they would have known that Sharon Tate and Altobelli were in Italy. So, because Altobelli was in Italy at the time of the murders. But I've never, I've never even heard a rumor or speculation that Altobelli was a target of these crimes. I do, I do believe that Altabelli knew what the crimes were about completely. There could even be something slightly suspicious in the fact that he was away from the house because I know he deeply disapproved of Frakowski being there. And, you know, he, now I've also heard that Altabelli continued into the, the mid seventies and even early eighties that Cielo Drive continued to be a drug and sex haven even after all the public attention. Cielo Drive itself is a character in this thing, and and its role as a drug-dealing hub goes back to when Melcher was living there. But no, I don't, I do not, I've never heard that Altabelli was a target or that anyone believed he was there. Although he did know Tex Watson, and he did know Charlie Manson very well. You mentioned Noel Emmons Manson in his own words earlier, which brings us to a question from Cliff Farnell. He asks what your take is on the account of the Tate LaBianca murders in Manson in his own words. Well, it's very interesting that that account differs from all others. And I think I knew Noel Emmons quite well <clears throat> shortly after he put the book out. And sort of what I imagined happened with Tom O'Neill's book the publisher, I, I mean, New Lemons told me that Grove Press tampered with the original manuscript, which he gave them greatly, and they just added things out of the blue or, you know, and, and Emmons himself, I don't think was, he was not a good writer. I mean, he was not a professional writer. So the book is a mess of various editorial approaches and Grove Press, the original publisher, put stuff in from other books. But what's interesting, there are many interesting things that are mentioned in Emmons' book that were not mentioned anywhere else before that. And one of them is the description of the murders, which is completely different than anything that had been printed before or since. And I would direct your, it's not exactly right either, as far as I know, but it's certainly different than the Helter Skelter and the, the usual scenario of, of how the murder is presented. I think you answered most of the other questions from the Education Forum within our discussion tonight. But the last one is from Dennis Barube. And Dennis, I apologize if I mispronounced your last name. But he wants to know, did Manson ever talk to you about Reeve Whitson in any way? No, never. And I have to say, until I read Tom's book, I have never heard that name I've looked into him a bit, but then that doesn't mean that that what O'Neill claims about this person isn't true. But no, Charlie never mentioned that and nothing. I mean, you have to understand, we talked about these things over and over again from different angles constantly. And he talked about his opinion of the CIA and CIA people that he had encountered, but not at that time. And no, there there was never any time where he mentioned any figure that even remotely resembles uh, that person. And until I read Chaos, I never knew the name. So I'm I'm not really in an authoritative place to even speak about it. But from Charlie himself, never, never mentioned any of that. 
I want to ask you about the historiography of this case a little bit. Now, because it's such a controversial case, you know that the books, of course, have uh, spanned the spectrum of possibilities, focusing on characters and focusing on uh, smaller and larger aspects of the case. But we do have the early books, of course, one being Bugliosi, which we've discussed tonight. And then we have works like Ed Sanders' The Family. Now, this spans through the growing number of books released this year. Which works can you recommend and which are to be avoided at all costs? Uh, well, I have a very different approach to it. Is I would say almost none of the published literature on Manson himself or the case is totally reliable. I can't think of a single volume I would ever say was totally reliable. Um, if you want to understand what the what the Manson commune was really like before the murders, I would say absolutely required reading is Lynette Fromm's book, which was published in August of last year, to very little acclaim and almost no media mention, um, Reflection, which is printed by Pizen Hall Press of George Stimson. If you want to have an understanding of what the group actually was, I would say Lynette Fromm's take on it is the closest to the truth. She does not in any way touch on the murders and, and what she does have to say about them is, you know, very indirect. So don't read that expecting a true crime book because it is frankly a little bit evasive about the crimes. But as a study of what this group actually was, aside from the sensationalism of it being a cult, a thrill kill cult, I would say that is required reading. Um, as far as all the other books, if you're a serious student of the case, there is valid information in absolutely every one of them. But the problem is it is diluted with an ocean of bullshit. And the problem is discerning which is which. Uh, Ed Sanders, the family, has very, very important information in it. But I mean, for uh, just to think off the top of my head, Ed Sanders was the first to mention Joel Rostow, the mo minor mob figure who brought drugs to Cielo Drive the night of the murders, and he was looking into Joel Rostow. Um, he also gets into this incident with Terry Melcher and a fight with a audio engineer that happened at Spawn Ranch in June of '69 that was seemed to be a significant factor. He gets into that in detail. There's a lot of very important information in Ed Sanders' book, The Family, because he was researching it even before Helter Skelter came out and sort of solidified the myth. So anyone should read it, but with a huge grain of salt, because then Sanders gets into nonsense like Satanism and the Process Church of the Final Judgment and the OTO and goes off into totally fictional left field. Uh, Tex Watson's memoirs, you should read Will You Die For Me, and his more recent online memoir to see there there are interesting things revealed there if you read between the lines and things that other researchers have taken further, little hints at things. But of course, Tex is lying. Susan Atkins' biography has interesting information in it, but the motive, there's almost nobody who has approached this story from the angle of wanting to tell the truth. They all have an axe to grind. Newell Emmons did his best with Manson in his own words, but it is, you know, a very deeply flawed book filled with misinformation. It's not Manson in his own words. So I have a different angle on it. I would say you've got to read, you must read Bugliosi to know the nature of the lies. And even Bugliosi reveals important things and details that if you have half a brain and you look into them can take you elsewhere. Um, there's a biography of Lynette Fromm that was out a few years ago that gives a much more objective portrayal of Manson than many other books do. I think it's just called Squeaky. But there, there's not a single, I mean, chaos, of course, has incredibly important information. So you should read it, but there's not any book that I can wholeheartedly recommend because it's all of them are filled with some 
they're there they have some sort of angle they're pushing and none of them are the full truth and i also have to say i have also not determined the full truth and i don't believe it ever can be as far as books to avoid completely liz wiles recent book hunting charles manson is genuinely worthless there is no it's it's definitely one of the very worst books but you need to approach this case if you want to understand it with a kind of obsessive attention to detail. So in that regard, read every single book that came out, except I, I would say wheels is the most worthless. Um, and you, and you, you have to learn to separate the wheat from the chaff. My life with Charles Manson by Paul Watkins is a good companion piece to Lynette Fromm's reflection in the early part, its description of Manson and the commune before the murders is, I think, quite authentic and valid. And then once it gets to the murder part, completely gets into Bouliosi fantasy land. Uh, even a recent book, A Member of the Family, is pretty good. So, you know, but but it's also the problem with it. It's it's from Snake, Diane Lake. And it's her biography. So her autobiographical part in the in the early part of the book is probably authentic and, and gives us some insight into how she became involved in the commune and what the early commune was like. But like Paul Watkins book and Susan Atkins book, once it gets into the murders, it just parrots the Bouliosi party line. So you have to read them all with a grain of salt. And I would think with your particular contingent of listeners it's sort of like looking into the jfk assassination you should shouldn't you read the warren commission report to know you, you've got to know thy enemy so i would say look at all the material and make up your own mind but there is you know there's not a single volume that is completely 100 percent reliable well, I think we're all waiting for the Manson file to be updated and re-released, which should be this month or next. Now, last time it topped a thousand pages. What kind of page count are we looking at this time? It was around a thousand, and to make it affordable, I cut. It. There was a very extensive discography of all of Manson's records in of, of his albums in the 2011 edition. And I cut that out and I will make it available online for people who are interested to make room for all the many more pages of information that I had to add. So it is kept within the thousand uh, page range, but a lot of material from the early edition that I thought was not as essential has been taken out and replaced with things that are more up to date, accurate, or, or just simply more pertinent, especially I mean, some of the chapters are not significantly changed since the 2011 edition, but the chapters about the murders and about Manson's musical career, I've got tons of new information, a lot of it gleaned from conversations with Charlie in the last years of his life, when he was much more forthcoming about this, and also, as I've mentioned, because of the technical innovation of him having access to a cell phone. He was able to talk to me privately and unlistened to, and so was a lot more frank about aspects of the crime. So there's, you know, a lot, a lot of information has been taken out that I think is not that important, and there's a lot of new revised information. So it still maintains the nearly thousand page um, number. Well, the last question I have for you tonight is this. If there were one document or one mystery that you would want solved, the answer to one question mm -hmm. regarding this case, what would that be? I don't think there's a particular document. I would say the prevailing mystery that continues to haunt me about this is my, and this is something I cannot prove, and it's just something that from having talked to so many people involved, on every angle of the case, the intense effort to cover up what is basically a banal drug deal gone wrong. Who is really being protected here? Because Sebring, Frakowski, Tate, Folger, are their reputations alone enough to, got, to have gone to this incredible 50-year effort to cover up what happened? 
what I would really want to know, and which I don't believe I ever will know, who else was involved with this crime on some level that necessitated the immensity of the cover-up? And I'm sure there is a whole other layer to it. And and that that would that would be the the prevailing mystery after all these years. Mm, yeah. So for anyone out there who would like to follow you online or like to find more information about the Manson file or just know more about the case, how can they follow you online? If you're interested in the Manson file and the case and Charlie and his philosophy, his music, his spiritual ideas, his ec- ecological ideas, then we have opened actually on two, in 2017 on Charlie's final birthday, we opened a closed Facebook group called the Manson File Myth and Reality of an Outlaw Shaman Official Circle, and that is attached to my Facebook page, Nicholas Shrek Official, and if you just answer three questions that are asked, you can then gain a huge uh, encyclopedia of information from very informed people and people who knew Charlie personally who were involved with that group, and that is where the publication of the book will be announced first. And then you can find me on all the standard social media platforms of Instagram, Nicholas Shrek Official, Facebook, and my website, Nicholas Shrek. So, you know, I'm I'm fairly accessible to find, and I will answer questions that are posed through my representatives if, if your readers have other or listeners have other questions, but I'd say the best source, if you're particularly interested in my work on Manson, which is only, you know, one strand of, of the work that I do, then you should sign up to the Manson file closed Facebook group. And this has been Nicholas Shrek, the author of the Manson file. This is his third appearance on the midnight rider news show. You should absolutely check out the other two. That's six hours of content, two episodes. And he goes into detail on the entire case. It's fantastic. I have yet to be disappointed. So Nicholas, I want to say that I can't thank you enough for the time that you do take. And and I know it's been a lot of time, but I can't thank you enough for taking the time that you take to do this with us. And by, by us, I mean myself, but also the listeners. You've always been so very kind and so very generous. And I want you to know that I really do appreciate it. It's a privilege and honor. And I always appreciate the, the high level of your discourse. And thank you to your listeners for their intelligent questions as well. So we will see each other very soon, I hope. Oh, I hope so. I definitely hope so as well. And when the book comes out, I definitely have some ideas. We've talked about a few of those. Uh, So I'll definitely be in touch regarding those. So I'm S.T. Patrick. This is the Midnight Rider News Show. We'll be right back. This is Richard Bartholomew of the Center for Deep Political Research. For more on the future of JFK assassination research, the deep political realities of the 2016 general election, and the research regarding the Mac Wallace fingerprint, allegedly in the Texas School Book Depository, listen to episode 70 of the Midnight Rider News Show. We really thought we had discovered something new. We really thought we discovered the answer. Drugs. Now, sorry, that isn't the answer we found out. But we really thought that was really, wait a minute, really that, we really believed, for a while anyway, that that was the answer. You're young and you think you know what the hell's going on. And that's exactly what we felt in 1969. But we didn't know. And it can turn ugly really fast. August 1969, the Tate LaBianca murders. And then we later would find out Charles Manson. Now, some may think, because of the way it's portrayed in the media, that we instantly knew it was Manson. But we didn't. You'll be looking into that soon when you read the Manson file. In fact, now do this. So for those of you who are interested in the story but are kind of new to it, do an experiment. I'm begging you to do this experiment. Before you read the Manson file, write down 10 things that you know about Manson and the Tate-LaBianca murders, or actually, rather, uh, 10 things you think you know about Manson and the Tate-LaBianca murders, because it's highly possible that after doing a little bit of research, which will inevitably lead to a lot of research, you'll be shown that nine or ten of these things are wrong. 
The Vincent Bugliosi mythology, the helter-skelter narrative, it can almost be labeled by this point as historical fiction. Sure, I mean, most of the names and dates are real, but other than that, it's time to explore other sources. Now, once again, you've been historically duped by a mainstream mass media in love with an archetype. Manson is just another lone nut. So, I mean, sure, they love the family because sex sells. And and believe me, had this been a commune of tomato-growing Amish folks, the media is much less interested. If seven people are killed on the west side of Chicago, they just call it a crazy Saturday night. This story... The helter-skelter myth, the helter-skelter narrative, the Bugliosi mythology. It's been dismantled by Nicholas Schreck. It's been dismantled by Tom O'Neill, though Nicholas and I may disagree slightly about how much so. The mythology has been dismantled by Jim DiEugenio in his two-part review of Chaos. This helter-skelter narrative has been dismantled by the throngs of citizen researchers who still chase this case daily and who dismantle mythologies as a hobby. It's that important to them. It's that important to us. Now, you'll quickly find this out on the Manson File Facebook page. You'll quickly find this out with every good book you read. But really, I don't have to tell you this because you already know this, right? You know what the mainstream media and the establishment historians do to truth. But that's why we're here. That's why Garrison exists as a journal. And that's why researchers like Nicholas Schreck spend a lifetime in search of truth. So we'll keep you up to date on the release of the Manson Files. Stay tuned for that. From the other side of the mountain, on the best side of midnight, I wish you peace. Peace.